Introduction to Quantum Information Processing. We are now beginning part four, which is on the subject of quantum cryptography. Broadly speaking, cryptography is communication in the presence of adversaries. In the typical scenario, there are multiple parties, some of which may be acting in an adversarial manner to either acquire or influence information in some manner that they are not supposed to. Quantum information has an impact on cryptographic protocols. Welcome to lecture 23. In this lecture, I will discuss one of the fundamental frameworks in cryptography where the goal is for one party to communicate with another on a communication channel in the presence of an eavesdropper. One of the contributions of quantum information towards this end is the BB84 key distribution protocol due to Charles Bennett and Gilles Brassard. I will give an overview description of their protocol. My description will not be complete and will not include a proof of security, but I will try to convey some of the main ideas behind the protocol and to give some intuition behind its security. The private communication scenario can be described in terms of three participants, Alice, Bob, and an eavesdropper, Eve. Alice and Bob can send messages to each other, but Eve can see each message. The goal is for Alice to convey a message to Bob in a manner where Bob learns what the message is and Eve learns no information about the message. If we look at this from Eve's perspective, she would ideally be able to break the system by learning Alice's message entirely. But it might be useful to Eve to even acquire partial information about the message, such as a subset of the bits. Depending on the context in which the system is used, some partial information may be enough for Eve to succeed in doing something that she's not supposed to. So we regard a system as secure if and only if Eve learns nothing at all about the message, not even the 23rd bit or the XOR of all the message bits. The advantage of adopting such a strong definition of security is that it's independent of the context in which the system will be used. There's a famous and very secure protocol called the one-time pad. This protocol assumes that Alice and Bob each share a secret key. This is a uniformly distributed random n-bit string k, and both Alice and Bob have a copy of this k, but nobody else has information about k. In particular, Eve has no idea what k is. From Eve's perspective, the state of k is a uniform probability distribution. Alice communicates an n-bit message m to Bob in the following manner. Alice computes the bitwise XOR between m and k. Call the string c, the ciphertext. Alice sends c to Bob over the channel so both Bob and Eve get to see what the bits of c are. Then Bob computes the bitwise XOR of C and K. The result is M because effectively each bit of M gets XORed with the same bit twice. So Bob acquires M. This is secure because what does Eve learn? Note that regardless of what M is, the distribution of C is uniform over all the n-bit strings. So what Eve sees is just a uniformly distributed string uncorrelated with m. Therefore, Eve acquires absolutely no information about the bits of m. This is called the one-time pad for historical reasons. There was a time when the keys were written on physical pads. And it's called one time because the key is never reused which is necessary for the security to work. 
a natural question about implementing this protocol is, how do Alice and Bob set up their secret key to begin with? Obviously, communicating this on the channel that Eve is eavesdropping on is no good. So there's a key distribution problem, which is to set up a large number of secret key bits to be used later on in the one-time pad. As I already mentioned in passing, it's essential that Alice and Bob do not reuse their key bits. If they have an n-bit secret key and Alice wants to send Bob two separate n-bit messages, m1 and m2, which is two n-bits in all, then using the same key twice will leak some information. To see why this is so, consider Eve's perspective. At the beginning, there are two to the two n potential messages. Once Eve sees the two ciphertext, call them C1 and C2, then from her perspective, there are only two to the n possible messages, one for each n-bit key. So seeing the ciphertext narrows down the number of possible messages from 2 to the 2n to 2 to the n. Here are some simple but cumbersome ways that Alice and Bob can set up a key. They can physically get together in some secure location and carry out some procedure for generating the random bits. Each stores a copy on some memory device. Or, if there is some third party that they each trust, that third party can provide each of them with a copy of a secret key. Of course, that third party would have to have a secure way of sending the information. A simple way is to visit each of Alice and Bob. There is an alternative approach to the whole private communication problem, which I'd like to review very briefly. It's based on public key cryptography. Public key cryptography is based on the presumed hardness of some computational problem. Bob produces two keys, a public key which enables messages to be encoded efficiently, and a private key which enables messages to be decoded efficiently. Bob sends the public key to Alice, and note that in so doing, Eve can also acquire a copy of the public key. Then Alice encodes her message using the public key and sends the encoded message to Bob. Then Bob, having the private key, can officially decode the message. The decoding function is effectively the inverse of the encoding function. So by having a description of the encoding function, Eve can, in principle, invert the encoding function using just the encoding algorithm. She could do a brute force search of trying all possible inputs to the encoding function to find a pre-image. But that takes exponential time. There are a lot of details that I'm skipping over, but under some unproven but plausible assumptions about the hardness of certain computational problems, there exist such protocols that are secure. For example, there are such schemes based on the presumed hardness of factoring. Oops, if we ever build a large-scale quantum computer, then that can be broken. With such a computer, Eve would be able to efficiently decode. With the advent of quantum computing, we should design systems based on computational problems that are hard for quantum computers. So the security of public key cryptography is impacted by quantum computers. There are some candidate problems that have not been broken by quantum computers, at least not yet. I'm going to leave the discussion of the large field of public key cryptography at that. What I want to do in this lecture is explain how 
quantum information can be used to solve the key distribution problem. The security will not depend on the presumed hardness of a computational problem. First, the scenario. Alice and Bob have two communication channels. They have a quantum channel over which Alice can send qubits to Bob, but Eve can intercept these qubits in transit and apply operations like measurements to them. They also have an authenticated classical channel. This is a channel over which Alice and Bob can send messages back and forth, and Eve can eavesdrop on this channel. However, she cannot modify any messages. She can see all the communication between Alice and Bob on this channel, but her access to the data is read-only. Notice that it doesn't make sense to have a read-only quantum channel, because in general, Quantum information cannot be measured without disturbing it. But there are ways of authenticating classical data to ensure that messages cannot be changed without this being detected. Can Alice and Bob create a secure secret key in this framework? That will be our goal. I'll describe the BB84 key distribution protocol that achieves this. I'd like to start by showing you some of the basic ideas used in the BB84 protocol. Suppose that Alice selects a random bit B and sends it to Bob as a qubit using one of these two encodings. The first encoding is with respect to the computational basis. The second encoding is with respect to the plus minus basis. Alice just selects the encoding randomly with equal probabilities. The computational basis state vectors are horizontal and vertical lines, so we'll abbreviate this basis with the symbol consisting of a horizontal and vertical line intersecting like a cross. The plus minus basis state vectors are at 45 degree angles, so we'll abbreviate that basis with the symbol consisting of two crossing lines at 45 degree angles, like an X. Now, what can we say about this way of encoding Alice's bit? Some good news is that there's no way for Eve to determine exactly what Alice's bit is. Eve doesn't know which basis to measure in. But here's some bad news. Bob is in the same boat as Eve. He doesn't know which basis to measure in either. And here's some mixed news. Eve can obtain partial information about the bit B. A particularly good measurement basis is the one that's halfway between the rectilinear basis and the diagonal basis, illustrated by the red lines in the diagram. That's good for Eve, but kind of bad news for obtaining security. However, if Eve does acquire some information, then she will disturb the state. So there is a probabilistic way of detecting Eve's tampering. That's bad for Eve, but good news for security. Eve cannot acquire information without running the risk of being detected. These kinds of ideas are going to be used as building blocks in the BB84 protocol. It might not seem like these effects are a lot to work with. What's Bob's advantage over Eve? But there's a way of leveraging these ideas to get a secure protocol. It's a very clever protocol. Okay, so here's how the BB84 protocol starts off. Atlas chooses n random bits, uniformly of course. Then Alice chooses n random bases on which to encode these bits. Then Alice creates the encodings of the bits as qubits. For every instance where a computational basis is chosen, that bit is encoded as a computational basis state. For every instance where a plus minus basis is chosen, that bit is encoded as a plus or minus state. Then Alice sends the encodings over to Bob on the quantum channel. 
Now, Bob receives those n qubits, but he doesn't know in which basis they were encoded, so he cannot recover them by a measurement. What Bob does instead is he chooses n random basis, and then he measures with respect to his basis choices. The result of the measurement is n bits. For each bit, there's a 50% chance that Bob guessed the right basis, in which case he obtains the same bit that Alice encoded. But there's also a 50% chance that he chose the wrong basis, in which case the result will be a random bit uncorrelated with Alice's bit. For approximately half of the bits, Bob's choice of basis will be correct. I've marked Bob's bits for the cases where he chose the right basis in dark blue. Those bits match with Alice's bits. I've marked Bob's bits for the cases where he chose the wrong basis in light blue. Each of those bits has a 50% chance of matching with Alice. Of course, at this point, Bob has no idea about which cases he chose the right basis. He just sees a string of n random bits. This is the end of the quantum part of the protocol. From this point onwards, Alice and Bob will communicate over the authenticated classical channel. He will see every bit, but will not be able to modify any messages. First, Bob sends to Alice the basis choices that he made. After receiving that message from Bob, Alice knows that Bob is done measuring the qubits that he received, and also Alice now has both her basis choices and Bob's basis choices, so she knows for which cases Bob picked the right basis to measure in. Next, Alice sends her basis choices to Bob. Notice that Eve also learns Alice's basis choices. But this information is not that useful for Eve now. If she had this information while the qubits were in transit to Bob, then she could perfectly measure them and without disturbing them. But Alice has received the message from Bob indicating his basis choices, and so she knows that Bob is done measuring the qubits. It's too late for Eve to measure the qubits in transit using this information. And at this point, Bob also knows his basis choices and Alice's basis choices. So Bob also knows in which cases the basis choices were the same. The next step is for Alice and Bob to each discard all the bit positions where the basis choices were incompatible. They each gather the remaining bits, which are approximately half of them, and over two bits. Call Alice's string A and Bob's string B. Now, what can we say about the strings A and B? If Eve did not interfere, if the qubits were not disturbed at all in transit, then A equals B. The bits match in all the cases where Alice and Bob chose the same basis. On the other hand, if Eve tried to measure some of the bits in transit, then the encoded states will be disturbed, so A might not equal B. Let's consider how that can work. Suppose Eve measures all the qubits in transit in a basis set she chooses randomly herself since she doesn't know which basis Alice and Bob used. Consider all the bits of A and B, which are the cases where Alice and Bob chose the same basis. For each such qubit, there will be a 50% chance that Eve chose the same basis as Alice and Bob. Those are the lucky cases for Eve, because those bits will still match up between Alice and Bob. But the cases where Eve chose the wrong basis, the unlucky cases, her measurement will project the qubit to the other basis. Whenever that happens, the chance of Bob's measured bit being the same as Alice's bit will be 50%. As a result of all this, each bit of A and B 
will match with probability 75%. So around one quarter of the bits of A and B will be different. In fact, Eve could do something better. Remember the in-between basis? The red lines from the previous slide? If Eve measures in that basis, then each bit of A and B will match with probability around 85%, the coast squared of pi over 8. So that's a better measurement for Eve to make. But still, around 15% of the bits of the strings A and B will be different. So both these ways, Eve's measurement causes inconsistencies in the strings A and B. How do Alice and Bob check these inconsistencies? Let's continue with the protocol. So Alice and Bob have their strings A and B, and they'll do some more classical communication. First, they select a random subset of half of their bits, and they compare those bits. That gives them an indication of how compatible their strings are, and how much tampering there was by Eve. If there were many inconsistencies, then they abort. Then they conclude that there was some significant tampering by Eve. But if there were no inconsistencies, then they continue with the remaining bits. Also, if there are a very small number of inconsistencies, possibly due to channel noise, or due to Eve only measuring a small number of the qubits, then they can still continue. Note that they cannot use the bits that they compared as their secret key bits because they sent those bits to each other over the channel. So Eve could see them. They are no longer secret from her. Alice and Bob discard those bits. They have been sacrificed in order to check the consistency of their overall strings. But Alice and Bob can continue with the remaining bits, the ones that they didn't compare. Those strings of remaining bits will be around n over 4 bits long. We can think of those remaining bits, shown as a2 and b2, as a decent first draft of a secret key. If Alice and Bob did not abort, then intuitively it seems that most of the bits of a2 and b2 will match and that Eve will have very little information about what those bits are. If there were very few inconsistencies on the random subset that Alice and Bob compared, then it turns out that Alice and Bob can infer that there was little or no measuring by Eve, and therefore the remaining bits are almost a good secret key. But it's not quite a good secret key. There might be a small number of inconsistencies in the bits, and the keys need to be exactly consistent to work. Otherwise, Bob cannot decode correctly in the one-time pad. And Eve might have done a small amount of measuring to acquire a small amount of information about the key. For example, Eve might have just tried to measure one single encoded bit, and she may have been lucky in guessing the right basis for that one case. In that event, Eve would know one of the secret key bits and without causing any inconsistencies. From this almost good secret key, Alice and Bob can tease out a good secret key. Some classical protocols have been devised for this. One such protocol is called information reconciliation. This is kind of like a form of distributed error correcting where Alice and Bob send messages back and forth to weed out any inconsistencies among their bits. They have to do this in a manner where they don't reveal these bits by sending them over the channel. It can be done, though the string of consistent bits will end up being shorter, shrunk by a constant factor. At that point, Alice and Bob's strings are the same, and Eve will have very little information about them but Eve's information will not be zero. The next step is called privacy amplification, where Alice and Bob eliminate Eve's partial information. Actually, they get Eve's partial information below some constant epsilon, which is positive, but can be much smaller than one. I'm not going to explain how information reconciliation and privacy amplification work. 
They are clever protocols that utilize concepts about error correcting codes. The final result is a secure key. But what does it mean to be secure? I've described a few attacks that Eve might try. She could measure a subset of the qubits either in a random basis or in the in-between basis. But those are not the only things that Eve can do. Let's consider the most general form of an attack that Eve can perform. Alice sends her n encoded qubits to Bob. What Eve could conceivably do is apply some big unitary operation of her choosing to all of those n qubits plus some ancilla qubits that Eve will hold on to. And then she lets the n qubits through to reach Bob. Now, Eve could complete her measurement by measuring those ancilla qubits now, but instead she delays doing that. Measurements are irreversible, and Eve still has a choice of basis in which to do that part of the measurement. She might as well delay deciding on the measurement basis until she sees all of the classical communication between Alice and Bob. That information might help her choose an optimal measurement basis. So Eve holds on to those qubits and listens in on the classical conversation C between Alice and Bob. After that, Eve performs the measurement on her stored qubits where the measurement basis depends on the conversation C. It turns out that any conceivable attack within our model can be expressed in this manner. Shortly after BB84 appeared, it was proven secure against various simple attacks, similar to the ones that I described earlier. For example, where Eve guesses a measurement basis for each qubit, or measures in the in-between basis. But it remained an open question whether it was really secure against a general attack. It was in 1996 that Dominic Myers gave the first true proof of security. His proof was quite complicated, and not many people claimed to understand it at the time. But it's better understood now and is regarded as correct, and it contained a lot of powerful ideas. In the year 2000, Shore and Preskill came up with a relatively simple proof of security. Their proof related the BB84 protocol to another protocol due to Chow and Lo in an interesting way using quantum error correcting codes, specifically CSS codes. I'm not going to explain the details of their proof here. Admittedly, I have not completely explained how BB84 works, nor have I proven that it's secure. But I hope that I've at least conveyed some of the general ideas behind this fascinating line of work. And I'll end this lecture now.